The Churches of Christ presents Speaking the Truth in Love, a program bringing you life's answers from the Word of God. Thank you for joining us for Speaking the Truth in Love. I'm James Johnson, the minister of Nettleton Church of Christ in Jonesboro, Arkansas. This program is brought to you by the Area Churches of Christ, which are listed at the end of the program. To help you grow in your relationship with God, we are offering free resources on both our Facebook page and our website. I encourage you to visit us there. Our lesson today is entitled, God Controls the Calendar, and our main text comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, all the way through chapter 5 and verse 10. But we're all concerned about the calendars now. Learning to write the next year on the calendar is always one of those things, and every time you write a check, you've got to remember to change the date. That's kind of what happens this time of year. In John chapter 20, Verses 26 through 29, it says, And after eight days, his disciples were again inside with Thomas. And Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst and said, Please, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands, or reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. You know, Thomas wasn't there when the other disciples saw it, and so this appearance was for Thomas's benefit. And Thomas immediately replied, he says, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Well, that would be you and I. We've not seen Jesus, but we believe. We believe all the things that are recorded to it, and we believe that he rose from the dead as well. There was a school teacher teaching school, and she asked the students, you know, if you wanted to have an instant answer to any question, if you were allowed to use your cell phone, what would you use? 
And they said, we'd use cha-cha. And he said, so what does cha-cha do? Well, cha-cha, you type in a question, it types back an answer. I bet you can remember the days you had a great big CRT TV that was huge and big and bulky. And times change. And as times change, we've got the flat screens now, the LCD TVs, those things like that. It was interesting to see a group of teenagers that they showed on YouTube trying to dial a rotary dial phone. They just didn't have a clue how to dial it, how to call a number, how to do anything on the rotary dial phone. Yet we grew up with that. And now we've got cell phones that are just instantaneously and they're always with us wherever we are. Back in the olden days, we used to use wash tubs to wash clothes, and then they came out with a washer that also had a ringer on top that you had to use to clean clothes. But today we have washers and dryers. I can remember when we got our first dryer and how we didn't have to hang the clothes on the line anymore because that made things different for our lives. So who knows what the future holds? Well, only God knows what the future holds. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised us up, who, he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and will present us with you. So we know that the Lord is going to come again and we believe that the power that is there to raise Jesus from the dead will also raise us up. And continuing on in verse 15, it says, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is for a moment, is working for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Looking at this chart, the priority of our inner man over our outer man. You know, it calls our our outer man a tent and it says that when we get to heaven we get a building but our outer man perishes and our inner man is being renewed day by day and since it's being renewed day by day as we grow closer to God and grow closer to him it's a spiritual growth that happens inside us and it says in Christ we are a new creation that's what it tells us when we come up out of the waters of baptism we are a new creation. And we have the promise of eternal life. Now going on, in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 19, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through the Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We have a great God and it says that he's gonna, Christ dwells in our heart through faith and that we're grounded in love we can't even comprehend the mightiness of God's love. And so we're filled with God's power and love. On this chart, we see the priority over the eternal, of the internal over the temporal. We know that there's some things that last forever, but the temporal are just perishing. It calls in our scripture our light and momentary troubles. We call that temporary. I can remember being in the hospital, and I can remember having a, uh, well, what's called a port put in my neck so that they could give blood and draw blood and they could give me medicine and everything when I had a major, major surgery. And 
I can remember thinking, oh, it's going to hurt. It's just going to be terrible when this thing comes out. Well, the day come when I got to leave the hospital, finally had the orders to leave. They came in there and they took those things out and it didn't hurt a, while, a bit. So what I'd worried about didn't really matter. And now I don't even remember the feelings that I had while I had that in there. But our light momentary troubles that we have on earth are temporary. The eternal glory exceeds all our expectation and we look forward to the eternal. And what is seen is temporal. And so these things that we treasure now will not be important in heaven. What is unseen is eternal. And it is eternal that we're looking for, so we need to concentrate on that. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Therefore, since we don't lose heart, we know that God is with us and that he is going to bless us. Number three. On this chart, we see we have hope because God controls the calendar, not fate. Some people say that the things that happen to you are just the fate, that these encounters that you have are just by faith, but it's not really that way. God controls the calendar. He's in charge, and we follow him. And so what he says here, while we're on earth, this physical body we have is wasting away. It's, it's not being renewed like it will be in heaven. It won't be the same. And it says that whenever we die, that whenever we go to heaven, we're going to be renewed into the image of Christ. We're going to have a different body. We're going to have a new body, one that doesn't have pain or suffering. And that should give us hope. And since we have the hope, what is to come is better than what we have right now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, it says this, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, eagerly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed we have been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we are not in this, for we who are in this tent grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that the mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he has prepared us for this very thing as God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. The Spirit is our guarantee of our future glory with God in heaven. So we're always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. That tells us there's going to be a judgment. But we, are, we can be confident if we belong to Christ. We can be confident when we face the judgment because we know that we are his. So we have some goals in life. We will one day have new bodies. This body we have that's perishing will become incorruptible, it says. It's going to be changed in a twinkling of the eye, really, as we're called up into heaven and we look forward to better things than our present situation. In heaven, there's no more tears. There's no more sorrow. There's no more death. There's no more pain. We are obedient to God's call to live a godly life in anticipation of our final judgment. You see, God calls us to be holy as he is holy and he wants us to live our life here in anticipation of the final judgment. So God controls the clock. God is in charge. And we live between the already and the not yet. The already is our life here on earth, and the not yet is our life to come in heaven. And while we live here, we realize that God is in charge and we follow him. And we're obedient to his will. Now, continuing on in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 20, it says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, 
by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even in so in Christ all shall be made alive. Adam was the first man. He sinned. Because of that sin, when he had knowledge that he knew what was right and he knew what was wrong, he knew he had done wrong. And so, it is since, he says, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Eventually, Adam did die. But he says, in Christ, all shall be made alive. That's the resurrection we're looking forward. But each in its order, Christ the first fruits, and after those, those who are Christ at his coming. We want to be a part of Christ at his coming. Now, in this chart, we see that man, according to what we just read, has a problem. And that problem is sin, and if man doesn't do anything about that sin problem, he faces death. But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ left heaven to come to earth to dwell here as a man. As he lived here, he lived a perfect life, and he was obedient to the Father, and he was willing to make a way for us to have eternal life by dying on the cross for our sins. And when he died on the cross for our sins, he opened the way for us to have eternal life. And he gives us this eternal life whenever we become a Christian, when we are baptized into Christ. This chart shows what we do. And this chart explains it. Really, there is a disconnect between man whenever man has sin and their face is death. But with Jesus Christ and the waters of baptism, we have eternal life. Moving on, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24, it says, Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he's put all things under his peace, but when he says all things are put under him, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted, meaning God. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So Christ is the Son of God. He is under God, but he is is part of the Godhead as well as long as as well as the Holy Spirit. So what is the already? Well the new age has come. It began on the day of Pentecost, whenever the disciples preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost there, and it says clothes of fire came down on the forehead, and they were able to speak in languages that they had never studied. And everybody there from all over the world were able to hear in their own language and they were told about the death of Christ and what it meant and how all these things had to come about and how everything was fulfilled. And then it says, what shall we do? That's what they said. They were pricked at the heart and they told to repent and be baptized, every one of them, for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus now rules as Lord, and the last days have begun. When you hear people say the last days, they've been around for a long time, since about 33 A.D., whenever the church began. And Christ reigns, and he is in charge of the church. He says, I will build my church, and he says the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Christ reigns, and he is in charge. What is the not yet? Well, we've not yet experienced the final end of this life. We've not gone into the grave. We've not been buried yet. We've not experienced that as long as we're alive. And so we've not seen the final end, the final time to be transferred to glory. We've not yet achieved the perfection for which God has destined us, and that's eternal life. So how do we live between the already and the not yet? Well, the in the world we live in is sinful and corrupt. We realize that. Tragedy still happen and death still happens, but our focus needs to be upon the reality of the unseen, the heaven that we look forward. Christ is in control, and we believe that God is the creator and Lord of all. So we must be trusting and obeying Christ and do the things that he has said. There was a tombstone, a man walked by, and it had this saying on this tombstone. 
It says, Paul, stranger, where when you pass by me, as you are now, so once was I. And I, as I am, so you will be. So prepare for death and follow me. Well, there was a guy came along and he got really, I guess it was chalk. And he wrote on the tombstone. And here's what he wrote. To follow you, I'm not content content until I know which way you went. Well, that's really really a good statement. We got to prepare for death. That's that's true. And we got to follow Christ, but we need to know where we're going. And we need to know what matters most. And what matters most is where you'll spend eternity when you die. And we got to decide now, are we going to be a part of Christ's kingdom? Are we going to be a part of his church? Are we going to belong to him? Are we going to be obedient to him in the waters of baptism so that we can have eternal life? The Bible says in Romans 6 and 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, it says, Seeing then you have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So we have a high priest. Jesus is after the order of Melchizedek, because Melchizedek precedes Abraham, and he precedes Aaron as well. But he, he was one who came to earth. He dwelt with us so he can sympathize with our weakness. He understood what it's been like to be tempted. And he was tempted, yet he did not sin. But because of his death on the cross, we can come boldly to the throne of grace. In Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 9, Now, when he had spoken these things while, he, while they watched, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. So he, he's on the mountaintop. He ascends. He's ascending into heaven. And while they looked steadily towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will, come, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So God controls the calendar. He knew that Jesus would ascend on high. We find Jesus going into the clouds. He ascends and he ascends into heaven. The disciples were looking around. What do we, what we do? And they, they were told that they needed to realize that Jesus was going to come back in the same way that he left. And they needed to go back to Jerusalem to begin there. And that would be told them what they needed to be do. And the Spirit would come upon them and they would preach the first sermon on the day of Pentecost. In Philippians chapter, uh, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21 plus 4, 1, it says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies that may be conformed to his glorious body, according to, working, to the working of by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. And then in 4.1 he says, Therefore, my beloved and longed-for brethren, my joy and my crown, stand fast in the Lord, beloved. So our citizenship is in heaven. We wait for a Savior there. And believe it or not, it says there that he's going to conform or change our bodies to be like his glorious bodies. And so we're going to be changed. And we long for our crown, which is mentioned here, but he says, stand fast. Don't let anything move you. Stand fast. Stand in the Lord. So it's God controls the calendar. We need to stand fast to be found in him. In Romans chapter 12, the first two verses says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 
We need to change our lives to conform to what God would have them to be. We need to renew our minds so that we have a, a mindset that's focused on what God would say. In Revelations 2.10, he talks about the crown again. He says, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. We look forward to that. Whenever we're faithful all the way till we die, it doesn't say we have a stopping point there, and he's going to give us the crown of life. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, says, then you have See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because God controls the calendar, we must be ready. We never know when the Lord is going to come, but we know he's going to come someday. That is promised. He says it's going to be like a thief in the night, and we're not going to have warning. In fact, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 to 11, he says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, God's timing, casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Those are the most wonderful words. He's going to perfect us. He's going to establish us in his kingdom. He's going to strengthen us. He's going to settle us. He's going to take us to be with him in glory. And then it says in verse 11, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We look forward to the day we can be with the Lord. God controls the calendar. If you have a Bible question, would like to receive a free Bible correspondence course, would like a copy of two free books, please contact the Nettleton Church of Christ. Speaking the Truth and Love is brought to you by these area churches of Christ. Speaking the Truth in Love can be viewed online at nettletonchurchofchrist.org.